leave Revelation just a little bit today and talk about Christmas and choosing life. Um, is it, are we on? Um, it, it, the people on the web are like, he asks that every week. But, um, but uh, I have a, a, interesting news, and I, I'll call it good news, and some, and some sad news. You know, I, I witness to people at every opportunity that I get and uh, try and do something with that all the time. And um, this past week has been kind of a crazy week. Um, I just put some brand new tires on my car and had the opportunity to really share my faith with a guy named Joe. Actually, two guys named Joe, which is interesting. And they're managers at Walmart where we get our tires. I bought the tires at Christmas or at Thanksgiving time at Black Friday, and they just had, they never had a chance to put them on. They're on my Pontiac, which I'm trying to deed to my grandson if he'll get his driver's license. But um, I'm trying to get it all ready for him. So I put new tires on it, and um, and I was driving Friday down the street, and pow! I heard this incredible explosion. And uh, well, let me go back one step more. I had the tires put on was able to witness to this young man. Uh, he was in the Marines, I believe, Navy. He was in the Navy, and now he's, uh, he's out. And um, he, kind of searching. Got three kids and a family. He's kind of searching. And, and uh, it was a good opportunity to share with him. And uh, then we got interrupted. It, you know, it, it's weird how the enemy interrupts you. Um, he, there's, there's a guy that's obviously... Um, uh, how do you say it? You know, he's obviously not in his manly ways, if I can put it that way nicely. And he came and interrupted him and was yelling at him about something. And it was just like the enemy came and sent this this guy that was uh, very, very infeminate, you know, with a ponytail and, you know, a little bob, like a bun like my aunt used to wear and earrings and, you know. I mean, really extreme and... and he knew he was recognizably gay and he, you know, but he started yelling at this guy and interrupted us. It was just like the devil came to interrupt. And so um, then we had some balance issues with the tire. Margie said it was wobbling, so I took it back in and had him rebalance it. And they rebalanced it. I got another opportunity to share with him and see what, what the devil means, you know, for bad. God can turn into good if you're walking in the ways that God have you walk. So then... But I, I kept feeling like I should get his name and try and connect with him. And I wasn't doing that. I was just witnessing to him while I was there. And, uh, and then suddenly I'm driving down the road on Friday. Uh, I just dropped Margie off at an appointment. And I was going to run some errands and go back and get her. And, and, uh, and kapow, I heard this just, it sounded like a gunshot went off. And yet there was no flat tire or anything. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And, you know, and I pulled over and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. So I ran to that Walmart, and I saw the other Joe, and I got to talk to him about the Lord, and he looked at the car, and he said, it's not the tire. He said, there's something else wrong. So I ran it to uh, Brakes Plus, where it wasn't too far away, and they said, yeah, it's your back spring. The weld broke on it, and it exploded on the... And unfortunately, it took my brand-new tire and just shredded the side of it, brand-new tire. And, I, of course, I didn't get road hazard guarantee because that never has seemed to work out for me over the years so I didn't have any road hazard protection so so it cost me um, it cost me a thousand dollars to have rear springs and the whole thing they call them quick struts and have that all put on there but fortunately they took three hundred dollars off and uh, and so it was only six hundred dollars or five hundred and forty nine dollars they were really nice to me but I had to go back and get the tire. So my son-in-law picked me up. We took the tire down to the to the Walmart. And I just got a good opportunity to speak with Joe again and was able to uh, talk to him about the Lord. And this time I got his phone number and his full name. And we're going to connect together. And we're going to have a we're going to have a time of studying the Word of God together. So praise God. I mean, just, you know, if it, if it cost me $600 to get back together with him and... Uh, he was real kind about the tire and everything, so it was real good. But I still had to pay for a new tire. And it just seemed bad. This, I mean, the, the little things had me. I, I didn't even have 50 miles on the tire. But anyhow, 
could have just happened on one of the old tires. But, you know, it's just money. And, you know, if we have an opportunity to, to share and somehow connect with that guy, you know, and, and somehow see him come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So that's the exciting part. And, um, and while I was sitting uh, at the Brakes Plus while they were doing my car, I was able to witness to the, the, the guy had to run me back and forth, the, the manager, he ran me back and forth. I got to witness to him and running me back and forth. And then there were some people in the, vest, the lobby or whatever you call it, waiting, the waiting room at Brakes Plus that I got to witness to them and tell them about Christ. And, and so it, it, it's, uh, it's just good. It's good. It costs a little bit of money, but it's good. But that kind of a high point, the, the, the low point, and, and I know this is Christmas, and I'm going to talk about Christmas and life. The, the low point is there's a young man that I've been giving my cards to and, and talking to him about Jesus at High V. And I go in every week, and, and to be honest, he, he was very slight. He was, you know, average height for a man, but very, very thin and very feminine. And, uh, and he was growing a long ponytail. And, um, and, you know, I didn't really get to witness to him much, but each time I went in that he was there, I'd, you know, say something to him about Christ and stuff like that. Well, we went in yesterday with my granddaughter. We had to run and get something. My granddaughter and I went, and he's no longer a boy. He's now a woman, and his name is Carolyn, and it just it just broke my heart, just absolutely broke my heart. He's wearing something to you know, and and it just it just broke my heart. What does our nation come to? What does our nation come to? The young man could be so misguided by society, so misguided by his family, so misguided by by science, and you know that he would think, you know, I, I knew he was kind of very feminine oh, and I've been seeing him there for like a year and then suddenly to come in one day yesterday and see that he had changed into a woman it just it just broke my heart and it was odd because something didn't ring up right I wouldn't even know that something didn't ring up right and they called him over he's a front-end manager and they called him over to to uh, to help me and it was just like oh my god what's what what have we done what have we done what what have we as Christians not done? You know, um, like that song said, save the trees and kill the children. And I think of people like uh, Nancy Pelosi and some of these people that are so outspoken about murdering babies. And, and, um, and now, praise God, we have a president that I, I don't know really where he stands on it. I know he was one way. Now he's gone another way. We've got a vice president. We know very clearly where he stands on it. And... Uh, it's just that we've got to really pray for America, and we've got to do diligence. I know it's difficult to say, well, I've got enough just to keep my job and raise my family, and, but, but we really need to think about long range for our children. What, what are we doing? What are we doing about? Because it's only salvation that will change people. We can't, the, the law, the only thing the law does is expose sin. That's all the law does. The law won't save you. The law never would save us. The law never saved anybody. The law only led us to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and that's, that's what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to be revealed through the law that we're sinners. And then we, then we come to know Jesus Christ. But there's only one way, and it's by other people. It's by us. Somebody led you to the Lord, whether it was as a child. Um, I know some of you came to the Lord as a child. Uh, maybe it was a... a a slow soaking like was for me you know I got Catholicism and then you know just kind of slowly I knew there was something wrong and I didn't want to go to hell hell was real to me I, I don't know how real hell is to children anymore I don't know how how real you know eternity is to anybody anymore and um, and they're so they're so misled and and I don't know how it's happened I don't know how it's happened we have people that that I'm close to in my family that would, would support what that guy had done. They would get angry at me for not supporting what that guy had done. And, um, and, and I'd say, how did that happen? How did that happen? They were raised in a Christian home, but you know they were so influenced by public school. They were so influenced by the media. They've been so influenced. And, and we as Christians have not done what we can do. And what we can do is not you know, carry placards and signs. We've done all that. We wash, we walk the picket lines at the abortion places and all that. Margie and I have done that. We've done those things. 
But, but I, I've come to the conclusion the only thing that will help is for people to get saved. That's, that's all. And, and God, whatever way, I, I love little Sarah, you know, we were talking about what they felt they were called to do. And she says, I want to do whatever God wants me to do. That's what I want to do. Whatever he calls me to do, I want to do that. And, and she just, that was, we heard it up here, but Margie's heard it from Sarah several times back there when they talk about Donnie being a prophet and, and Daryl wanting to preach, and you know, and as they go through the, the various children and what their calls, they feel that they have Natalie wanting to be a missionary. And several times Margie's gotten in the car with me after service. She says, oh, Sarah, so sweet. She just wants to do whatever Jesus tells her to do. And, you know, it, it, it's, um, it, that's where I want to be. She's inspiring to me. I, I want to do that. I want to be the evangelist and the prophet that, that, or the prophet that Donnie wants to be. I want to be the evangelist pastor that Daryl wants to be. I, I want to be a missionary like Natalie, but I also I want to do whatever God has called me to do, and that's what I want to do. And, and it's very difficult because we think we know what he's wanting us to do, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes, a lot of times, we don't really know. And I wouldn't have chosen to have the car fall apart, but, you know, on the flip side, praise God, it's not going to happen to my grandson when he's driving it, you know, so... So that's a good thing, you know. So, um, it, it, you know, it, it's hard to view those things as a good thing. But, but I, I just want to do what God wants me to do. Just what Sarah says. I just want to do what Jesus wants me to do. And don't lose that. Don't ever let her lose that. Don't let Donnie ever lose the heart of a prophet. Don't let Daryl ever lose the desire to evangelize and preach. Don't let Natalie ever lose that desire to be a missionary, wherever it might be. Um, it, you know, it, it's, you know, people grow up that, oh, I want my son to be a soccer player. I want my daughter to be a volleyball player. I want my, you know, child to be a football player, whatever. But, but what an honor it is to, to work for God. What an honor it is to work for God. I've told you before, get that video, Chariots of Fire, and it'll be, it'll be inspiring to you to see how Eric Little um, literally almost gave up a gold medal as an Olympian and ultimately became a martyr in China as a missionary. And um, so I, I, just, I just encourage you. I know I do this all the time, but we have, to, we have to do what our Savior has called us to do, whatever it might be, whatever it might be. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Christmas and choosing life. And that's not necessarily, a, 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 you know, a life choices in abortion and that sort of thing but christmas choose life i want to i want to talk about jesus luke 2 11 says for unto us you is born this day in the city of david a savior who is christ the lord and this will be the sign to you you will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth lying in a manger suddenly there was an angel a company of heavenly hosts praising god and saying glory to god on the highest and on earth Peace and goodwill towards men. That our God would come down. We sang that song earlier. That his, his tiny fingers, you know, touched the heavens. And, you know, and, and he chose to be. And he didn't just choose to be a man. He could have come down, you know, in some lost jungle. He could have been just transported down as a grown man. And then did everything he did. You know, came into the world, walked into the world. But he didn't do that. He did, he, he did it right. He did it absolutely the right way from the birth, and it's so cool, it's so cool, when you go through the logistics of it, being an engineering manager my whole life, it's just so cool for me to see how logical God's plan is, how he had, he'd known that, you know, that the bloodline of sin would pass down through Adam, but there'd be purity available through Mary, and uh, that there could be that virgin birth, and there could be, you know, a place for him to come down and renew the covenant. He knew all along what he was going to do. And he knows all along what he's going to do now. He knows the state that America is coming to. He knows that the state that the world is coming to with people killing each other, bombing each other, blowing each other up over Allah or whatever they do, you know, the, the madness, the insanity that's going on in the world today. And it, God, is, God knows, God knows and he's coming back. But it's getting so bad that I wonder when is he coming back? How soon is he going to come back? How bad can it get before he comes back? And see, we can go through life and say, oh, I'll go to the grocery store. I do, you know, 
and, and miss all this. Just miss, miss this whole mess that's going on around us. We can, we can, the, the media doesn't want to tell us about the catastrophes that are going on in the rest of the world, the starving people, the disease outbreaks. We're living in kind of a fantasy world in America, and we don't see it. And, and so the only way that we're going to know what God wants us to do is we've got to pray, we've got to be in his word, we've got to seek his face, we've got to say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I mean, as we're here in this church, you look at it and there's so few people, and, and you might say, gosh, Jim, is that what God wants you to do? Right now, I believe in my heart that's what he's called me to do, no matter how many people are here. If it's only, if it's only four of us, then, then we'll be here as long as God allows it. We'll be here doing what God has called us to do. But, um, but when he takes it away, he takes it away. And so, and, and we'll go, I'll still go do, Margie and I will still go do what God has called us to do wherever we go, whatever we do. And so I want that to be in your thought processes. I want that to be in your mind is what is God calling me to do? What does God want me to do? And, you know, I can stand up here and express it. I always feel so, so helpless and shallow when I stand up and express things like that. But I know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your hearts. I know the Holy Spirit is working in you. To, to bring you to where you need to be. But you have to draw near to God for God to draw near to you. That's what his word says. And he doesn't break his word. He, you know, he'll, he'll once in a while he'll do something wild and crazy like Paul on the road to Damascus. But, but in all honesty, Paul sought God incredibly his whole life. When he was still Saul, he sought God incredibly his whole life. Peter and the other apostles that walked away from their, from their successful businesses and their livelihood and their in their traditional family as it was in those days, they decided. They made a, they made a choice. And, and we have to, God chose life. God chose life for mankind. I'm gonna, I want to show you that, that it, it was, he chose life. And, and he started it all as, you know, obviously long before creation. But he started it on this earth as an infant baby. He chose life. He chose not to be some, miraculous spirit that showed up out of nowhere he, he he decided to do it all through life and he brought life from the time he was an infant in john 1 1 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he was in the beginning with god and all things were created through him and without him nothing was created that was created <coughs> and it says in him was life and the life was the light of mankind in him was life. I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but in God, in Christ, in Jesus, he chooses life. He chooses life. He chooses life. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but God chooses life. I want you to see this. John 1.12, all who received him, he gave the power to become sons of God to those who believed in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Choose life. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and he, we saw his glory and the glory as the, as the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. He brought us life. Deuteronomy 30, 19. You, you guys know this verse. I'm sure you know this verse. I call heaven and earth as, a witness, as, a, as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life and death, <coughs> blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. That both you and your descendants may live. That you may love the Lord <clears throat> your God. And that you may obey his voice. That you may cling to him. Cling to him. I mean, cling to him. So often we don't cling to God. Unless we're in situations where we find ourselves in, in, in dire straits. It's rare that we really just cling to him. But yet, he, we're called to cling to him. For he is your life. He's your life and the, links of, and the length of your days that you may dwell on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob to give them. He is your life. He comes to bring life. Choose life. Adam and Eve, there was a tree of, of good and evil and there was the tree of life. And the tree of death. That's what it was. The tree of life and the tree of death. Because they were going to die if they ate if you eat of this tree, you'll die that day. And they did die that day, 900 years later. But with a day, a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day with the Lord. They died in that day. 
God was merciful enough to give them 900 years. But, but they died in that day that they ate the fruit. They chose death. Don't choose death. And don't choose death for others around you. Because if we don't share the gospel, if we don't share, share the gospel, in a sense we're choosing death for those people where, that God places before us, the people that God presents us to. Now you're saved, you're going to go to heaven because you chose life, you chose a relationship with God. But, but do you, you actually, we have the opportunity to choose that for other people. What we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What, what, what do you do with what you've got? See, we've got, just as that person that I, I talked about that's become a, 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 a woman from a man, that person was indoctrinated he or she or it, whatever you want to call it now, was indoctrinated to believe that that was the way to think. That was the way that they could be. That was okay. And, and some of my family members that, that aren't walking with the Lord, they, they think that's okay too because they were indoctrinated in that way. I want, you to, I want you to know. I want you to know that we have been indoctrinated into the way of life that we live. We have been indoctrinated into the life that we live. Donnie... Donnie's being indoctrinated to believe that he's a prophet because he's had several instances where, where, he's, where he's expressed things that turned out to be the way that he expressed them, the way he saw them. Daryl, in his heart, wants to be an evangelist or preacher. He knows. And we saw him stand up here and sing a song all by himself today, just completely, just completely. There's, he's, he's, he's a born extrovert or whatever you want to call it. He's, he's got that calling on his life. Natalie, you know, becoming a missionary. What does that mean? But see, she's thinking those thoughts. Those thoughts are planted in her mind already. Sarah, you know, the willingness to do whatever God calls me to do. Those things are planted in their minds. And it's so important that we find whatever way we can to keep that thought process going so that when they grow up, they don't just think that you have to be what you're going to be because, because that's how the system works if that makes any sense. I, I don't want them to grow up. I mean, I, they're not my kids, they're yours. But I, I don't want the kids of this next generation to grow up the kids, that the past generation that I'm seeing and happen now. I don't want the world to indoctrinate them. I want, I want God and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to indoctrinate their thinking. I want them to think it's natural for them to become a prophet. I want them to think it's natural to become an evangelist or a pastor. I want it to be natural for, for Natalie to become a missionary. I want it to be natural for Sarah to do whatever God's called her to do. I want it to be natural that each one of you do what you're called to do. But you've been indoctrinated. You've been indoctrinated. The only way to undo that is through the Word of God. You have to renew your mind. And you can't renew your mind without this Word because anything else is indoctrination of the world. This is what God has called us to do. This is natural. A natural Christian follows Mark 16 and just goes out and does whatever God has called him to do. A natural Christian doesn't fear the loss of income, doesn't fear the loss of a job. I, I, was, I, I was a Christian for 18 years before I had the courage to leave the, the career world. And God has provided for us. God's met our needs. We don't have a lot, but God has provided for us. God's met our needs. I, I You know, I left that that career world with the big salaries and benefits and power and authority over the whole United States in the company that I was in. Yet, to be here with you, to be here with you, to take the message to America, it took me 18 years, 18 years to get the courage to do that. I don't want these kids to have to do that because, see, I had been indoctrinated I had been indoctrinated by the system that you have, to have a, you have to have a mortgage, you have to have a house, you have to have two cars, maybe three. You have to have a two-car garage or a three-car garage. and You have to have this kind of a house in, in this kind of a neighborhood. You have to live like this. We were indoctrinated. And, and I'm telling you that the kids that Tom experiences in the prison, the young people that he experiences in the prison that ends up in jail for their crimes, they were indoctrinated to that lifestyle. 
They were convinced somehow that if you needed money, you go down to the quick shop with a gun and you take it. Somehow that system was indoctrinated into their minds. And it's very sad because a generation before, those same people would have been active in their churches. They would have been in their churches and active as their parents were. But we incentivize them to, to, to keep the husband out of the household and pay the wife for as many kids as she could have. And then they grow up and they, they, don't have, they don't have the right indoctrination. They don't have the biblical indoctrination. It's so important. But see, you have a different indoctrination. So you have fears based on those indoctrinations. I can't do this. I can't leave that. I can't go do wild and crazy things. Because how am I going to be provided for? How's this going to happen? And maybe it's not going to happen today. Maybe it's not going to happen but five years, ten years, I don't know. But it took me 18 years to get to a place where I could walk away from this world and the things of this world. And I still have, you know, things that meet my needs. I mean, I still are, I'm okay. I still provide for my family. But, but I was able to walk away from it when I was 51 years old. And, and God has met my needs. But I was scared. I was scared. It didn't make sense. Margie wasn't comfortable with it. You know, she wanted, she was kind of like Sarah, let's do whatever God wants us to do as long as we still live in this house and have this car and you've got a job and you bring home a picture. You know, we'll do whatever God wants us to do. So it was, it was very difficult. But develop a plan between you and God. Have a plan. Have a plan. What am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do to impact? And you can do it right where you are. Don't get me wrong. That may be the conclusion that you come to between you and God. It might be that he's using you right where you are. Doing right exactly what you're doing. But, but think of it. Is it life? Are you bringing life? Because that's what God brings is life. This flesh is dying and dead. It's born dead. It's born, it's born cut off from God. And the only life I have is when my eternal soul is infused by his Holy Spirit. Then I have life. And, and I want to take that life to other people. Do you want to take life to other people? Because, see, we wouldn't have all the abortions we have today if Christians had been due diligent to, to step out of their comfort zone, to step out of their, 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 their American way of life and be willing to live this life. If, if we had done that, we wouldn't have... 50-some million babies murdered in the United States over the last 20 years, 30 years. That wouldn't have happened. We'd still be going to church and, we, and, and businesses would be closed on Sunday. All these things that I experienced when I was a kid, that would have still been going on. But somewhere along the line, we said, we want, we want, we want the world instead of the Word of God. I remember as a Gideon, when I was a first a, a, a Gideon, uh, we had a guy come and speak to us, and he said something that was just shocking. He was an older guy, and he said, you know, when we, when we defeated uh, Japan with, with the bombs, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when we defeated them, you know, they came because they were an Eastern uh, religious-based country. They came to our country and, and to our leaders and said, we want to serve your God because your God is more powerful than our God. See, right now, the, the, the terrorists believe that their Allah is more powerful than the true than Jesus Christ. They think that Allah is more powerful. They don't understand the power of God because the Christians have not lived in that power. We don't live in the power of God. We live, we live with food, fun, and fellowship and a social church, and we don't live in the commitment that they're, that they're in. But the Japanese came and said, you know, we want your God. We want your God. And they came to the, to the Gideons and they wanted 12 million Bibles. 12 million little New Testaments. They, wanted, they came asking for the 12 million little New Testaments. It would, have cost, it would have cost about $6 million because they were about 50 cents a piece in those days. This is right after World War II. And the Gideons could not get Americans to give enough to give them those 12 million. They gave them some smaller number, but they could not give, get enough money from the people in the United States because obviously there was a lot of angst against the Japanese to begin with but still they could not get the money to do it 
And then he said later, later he had gone to Japan, this man that was speaking to us. He said later he'd gone to Japan. And he said, you know what? They did find our God. They did find our God. They found our God in auto manufacturing. They found our God in, in the glitz. They found the, our God in all the stuff that we really had as gods in America, our possessions. They found our God because they found our, our God in, in, in the rock music, in the heavy metal. They found our God in, in, in glitz and stardom and acting. And they found our God in, in overindulgence and things of this world. They found our God. But it wasn't the God that, that we could have brought to them. But because of our selfishness, we didn't bring them our God. And you're saying, how's this about Christmas? Because Jesus came and died. He came, he came and died to bring us life. He came and died to bring us life. Adam and Eve chose death. We don't want to choose death for people. Yet when we don't share the gospel with people, when we don't indoctrinate ourselves and our thinking to the things of God, and, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because you guys are homeschooling or sending your kids to Christian schools, you're doing the right things, but the world has the world has had more power over our children. And Lynn and I, we can talk about that. We can tell you about our kids and the situations that some of our our own offspring are in because we gave them more of this world. And we let them be indoctrinated by the school system, indoctrinated by the social system that's that's existing, indoctrinated by the media, instead of indoctrinating our own kids. And that's happening that's happening all over the church in America. That's happened all over the church in America today. In America today, kids are being indoctrinated. I told, you, I told you last week that my grandson, my wife gave him a bookmark for his school book that he brought to our house, but it was a Jesus marker that she was going to give to the kids here, and she had an extra one she was going to give it to our grandson. And he says, I can't take that to school. Eight years old, I can't take that to school. And I said, why not? Because it says Jesus on it, and we're not allowed to bring Jesus stuff into the school. Eight years old. And he was genuinely fearful that he would get in big trouble at school. And he's a tough little kid. He's a tough boy. He's a fighter. He's a strong little boy. But he was genuinely, you could see fear in his eyes. As, as Margie tried to talk him into putting it in his book, he did not want to put that in his book. He was scared that he would get rejected because he had a Jesus bookmark in his book. So you see, we, you, you have no clue what's going on in that school. You have no clue what's going on in the media. You have no clue. We're being indoctrinated. They, they, they keep lying about the Russian stuff. They keep lying about the Russian stuff. They don't care. They could care less whether they ever prove any Russian stuff about our president. All they want you to do is have in your mind that he did something wrong. I don't know what it is, but he did something wrong. They want that in your mind. They don't care if it's ever proved. They don't care. They, they don't care because if they cared then Hillary Clinton would be in jail for what she did. She broke specific laws. I mean, she broke laws that any one of us would be in prison for many years because of it. Blatantly broke. They don't care about justice. They're, they care about indoctrinating you. They're trying to indoctrinate you, indoctrinate your children. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus comes to bring life. And life abundantly. That's what he said. Came to bring life and life abundantly. We, we sometimes, that, that equates in our mind and our thinking that life abundantly means lots of stuff, lots of success, lots of bank accounts, lots of cars, lots of big houses. Life abundantly. But it doesn't mean that. It means life for me and life for everybody that I encounter. Life that everybody I, I meet with. The road is narrow and not many are going to go there, but the road to destruction is wide and many will go there. But, but we have the opportunity to bring life, even though, even though we'll be rejected. Many, many times we'll be rejected. I didn't know what to say to that, to that boy that had changed into a girl. He's probably about 18, 20 years old, somewhere in that time frame, maybe in his early 20s. It's hard to tell because he's real infeminate, so it's hard to judge his age as a man. He had makeup on his bristles so you couldn't see. Unless you were up close, you couldn't see. 
is bristle from shaving. It, it, it's, uh, I, I don't even feel like, what could I even say to him? I didn't even know what to say anymore to him. I, I'm lost. God, what do I say to these people? What do I say to somebody that's made that choice? How do they ever repent? How do they, how do they repent once they've made that choice to change? How do they repent? Do they change back? I mean, what, what do they do? How do they repent? It's like you've gone to a place where you can't return from. Yet the world has convinced them that that's okay. Jesus Christ, God born in a manger, Emmanuel, he brought life. I'm just going to run through some stuff here. Everywhere he went, he brought life. At age 12, I must be about my father's business. At 12 years old, he was bringing life. The woman at the well, life. The dead girl, she only sleeps, life. The dying servant, life. The ten lepers dying bit by bit from their leprosy, he brought them life. Only one came back and thanked him, but he brought them life. The woman with the issue of blood, he brought her life. Twelve years of suffering, he brought her life. The woman being stoned to death for her sins, he brought her life. Born to a virgin, life. Healing the royal official son, life. Healing the Capernaum demoniac, life. Healing Peter's mother-in-law, life. Healing the sick during the evening, life. Healing the leopard, life. Miracle of, being, of healing a centurion servant, life. Healing a paralyzed man, life. I just went down through the scriptures and said, where did he bring life? Raising a widow's son, life. Healing the, the, the man possessed at, at, that word I can't say, Gera, whatever it is. Life. Healing a woman with eternal bleeding, life. I talked about that. Healing, raising Jairus' daughter, life. Healing two blind men, life. Healing mute and demon possessed man, life. Healing a 38-year-old invalid life. You know, the man at the well. Miraculous healing of many people in, in, in Gennesaret. I don't know why I put these words down. I can't pronounce. Life. Healing a girl possessed by a demon. Life. Healing a deaf man with a speech impediment. Life. Healing a blind man. Life. Healing a man born blind. Life. Healing a demon possessed boy. Life. Healing a blind and mute man who was demon possessed. Life. Healing a woman with eight year infirmity, infirmity, life. Healing a man with dropsy, life. Healing ten lepers, life. Raising of Lazarus from the dead, life. Healing Bartimaeus of blindness, life. Restoring a severed ear, even at the very end of when he was going to go to the cross. He brought life. His cross, he brought life. His resurrection, he brought life. His ascension, he brought life. And now he offers the whole world life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that would ever believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. How? How does he offer life now? Through you and me, life. He isn't here anymore. He isn't, he isn't walking the streets in Israel. He's not walking the streets in New York or San Francisco or Omaha, Nebraska. He's not walking. He's not walking those streets. So how does he bring life now? Through us. And if we don't do it, nobody's going to do it. That's how his plan is to work. We're to bring our brothers and sisters. See, whether we like it or not, these sinners, these, these terrorists, these, these awful people, and, and the person of Adam and Eve, they are brothers and sisters. We are related to them in the flesh. Not in the spirit. We're sons of God in the spirit now. But we're related to, there are brothers and sisters and they're dying. We don't want to think of them that way. Because, you know, they're distant. They're, they're not the same color maybe. They're not the same language. They're not the same culture. But that's how, that's how life comes to the earth today is through us. Through his disciples, multiply himself to the whole world, life. Mark 16, 50, and he, and he, Jesus, said to them, Go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who is not believed will be condemned. 
the people that we don't witness to, the people that never have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the people who don't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because we're not walking in the anointing we should be walking in because we spend time with the Holy Spirit, spend time in His Word, know His Word, be able to share His Word because we don't walk in it. They're condemned to damnation. That, that's what he's trying, to, he's trying to express here. He who does not believe will be condemned. If I don't give somebody a chance to believe, they're already condemned. If I, don't, if I don't use my life that was given to me by Jesus Christ through his death and resurrection, if I don't use the life that he's given me, there are people that are going to be condemned to hell because I don't use my life. And this isn't about guilt. This is about life. It's just that we don't read this right. We, we're so indoctrinated. We read that and we say, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Our first thought is, well, that was their choice. That was their choice. But if we never went out to preach, if we didn't fulfill the first part, if we didn't go to the world and preach the gospel to every creature, then they didn't have a choice to be condemned. They're condemned because I didn't do my part. This isn't preached enough in church today. This isn't preached enough because, because it scares people. It takes them out of their comfort zone. But I'll tell you honestly that if you go and do what God has called you to do, He's got plans for you. He has plans and they're good plans according to Jeremiah. Matthew 16, 18. I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We know that. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He'll give us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. We have the key to the kingdom of heaven. When he sent out the 70, he says, go and tell them that the kingdom of God has come near you because the kingdom of God dwells within us. We have the key to the kingdom of heaven. And whether people want to accept it or reject it, we have the key to the kingdom of heaven. And what I, what I loose on earth, what I bind on, on earth will be bound in heaven. And what I bound, loose on earth will be bound, will be loosed in heaven. <clears throat> if I can get that right. I have the key. Not just Peter. Not just a pope somewhere or something like that. God has given you the key. When you gave Jesus Christ your life, he's given you the key. Think of it this way, you're standing, in, you're, you're a fire person and you're standing by a hot door and you have a key to that door and somebody on the other side is burning to death. Pretty soon the smoke inhalation will take them and then after the smoke inhalation takes them, they're, they're going to burn to death. And you have the key, you have the key to that door. They can't get out because the door is locked and you have the key to that door. Are you going to unlock that door for him? Are you going to open that door for him? You have the key to the kingdom of heaven. Hey, what you loose, what you bind, what you choose not to unlock, will be bound for eternity. What you choose to loose could possibly, based on their choice, of course, be loosed for eternity. He has put it in our hands. Now what are we going to do? 2 Timothy 4, 5. This is what Paul said while his life was being poured out. He said, my life's being poured out. I've done what I'm supposed to do. There's a crown of life laid up for me in heaven. <coughs> I fought a good fight. And he writes this to Timothy. But you, have, <coughs> but you be watchful in all things. Endure affliction. Do the works of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. He told him, there's going to be afflictions. Fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. Individuals in here, pray, God, show me what my ministry is supposed to be. Please don't just, time is so precious, don't let my life just spin away. I'm 69 now. I, I, you know, I, I think back when I was 18 and got married to Margie, almost 51 years ago. It, it, life just spins away. Use every moment of it. 
fulfill your ministry. Get together as a couple and pray and say, what can we come to agreement with? What can we come to agreement with what God is calling us to do so we can go do it? What can make our life together meaningful in this world? And yes, it begins with your kids. Yes, it, it begins with providing for your family and that sort of thing. But, but you need to come together as a couple, as couples, and say, what, what are we supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to be doing with this life? Time is speeding away. Time is speeding away. Fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. If, if you go out of here with nothing else, take two words, life and fulfill your ministry. You have the key. You have the key. Are you going to lose them or leave them bound? Father, I praise you and I thank you and I give you the glory. Thank you for coming down as an infant to show us how to live. Thank you for coming into this world so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Help us to share that life of abundance in Jesus Christ. Help us to know where to go, what to say, who do we speak to, how do we do it, what do we do next. Help us not to be fearful, full of fear of failure. Help us not to be lethargic or lazy about what you've called us to do, Father God. But, but open doors, open doors. Help us to draw near to you so you know to draw near to us. Help us to know what we should do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys again for this wonderful card. I appreciate that. It's well needed and will be used in a good way. Thank you. Let's close.